Amen. Okay, so quick review. Look up here on the screen uh, where we were last week. We moved from our first two weeks looking at the holiness of God, letting that be our foundation, and then we moved into understanding this idea of justification. Scripture talking about how we have been justified. We saw last week that that means that we were declared righteous. And so to understand justification, we began combing through these things you see up here on the screen. First of all, to understand it, we need to understand that God is the absolute standard. He is righteousness. He is holiness. He is perfection. And so that has to be the starting place. Then from there, we see that we as human beings, what are we? We are guilty. We are condemned by our sin and we are helpless to save ourselves. So there is no hope in and of ourselves that we have to be righteous. So we saw those things. So then that left us last week, and we left it in this tension of the dilemma that we feel as human beings. How can we be made right with a holy God as sinful people? And so we looked at that. We, we began moving toward that to see how God is able as in his holiness to declare us righteous He can't just excuse sin. That was one of the big things we saw. So something else must be done in order for God to say those who are guilty are not guilty. Those who are unrighteous are righteous. And so what we're going to see tonight is to understand justification. The way God does that is through Jesus, God in the flesh, God incarnate. He is the sinner's representative, and he is our substitute. So we're going to unpack that tonight, look at a lot of Scripture. And so get your Bibles out, uh, because you are going to start with an exercise, okay? you got to work out some of the, uh, you know, just some of your, uh, I don't know if you had dessert tonight. If you had some of that uh, creamsicle cake, you need to, you just got to do a little work here and uh, work some of that out. So what I want you to do is turn to Romans chapter 5. We're on page 18 of your handout, if you're following along. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. What we're going to understand in this passage, what you're going to see as you read these verses, is that Paul says that we are united with the first Adam, the Adam of Genesis 1. We are united with him in very specific ways. But then he says, we are also, though, united with the second Adam in very specific ways. And that that second Adam is the Lord Jesus. And so here's what I want you to do for just a few minutes to get your minds going here. Read that passage of Scripture. Use your note pages or even the margins of your Bible. I want you to write or even underlining in your Bible. you got a page out to the side that's blank. Make you two columns. First Adam, second Adam, and I want you to write down all the ways you see in this section of Scripture how we are united with the first Adam and then all the ways that we are united with the second Adam, Jesus. Okay, so take a few minutes to do that, and we'll jump back in here together uh, when when you get done. I'll give you about five minutes or so to look through that passage, okay? Take off. No cheating, Danny. Um, you got to do your own Romans work. 5, verses 12 through 21. I think we can go ahead. Okay, so we didn't put microphones out tonight, so, but I still want to hear some feedback. Let's start with the first Adam. What were, some of the, what were some of the things that unite us with the first Adam? Sin. That kind of summarizes it. That's good. Anything specific? Disobedience. Disobedience. Condemnation. Condemnation. Death. Death. Said death spread to all men. It's not very positive. Anything else? Brokenness, broken relationships. Yes. Judgment. Judgment says that we were made sinners because of the first man's sin. Okay, so not a great list, is it? How about the second Adam, our Lord Jesus? What, how were we united with him? 
What does Paul say? Yeah, he uses that phrase so often there, doesn't he? The free gift, and he says this free gift of grace. What else does he say? Righteousness, Righteousness, this free gift of righteousness. Eternal life. life. Yeah, obedience. Justification. Justification. Instead of condemnation and judgment. We were made sinners in Adam. He says we were made righteous in Christ Jesus. He says it's an abundance of grace. I like that. New life. Yes. Very good. So this passage is so helpful for us to begin to see how it is that Jesus is the one that is our justifier. He is the one that allows God to declare us righteous. So as, as you think right back to the screen and, and we think of our sin and the separation from God, we think of, the, of this massive dilemma, how can a person be made right with God? And now we come to the answer that Scripture gives. Well, Jesus, the God-man, is the one who uh, takes the place of He is righteous, and he gifts us his righteousness in exchange for our sin. 2 Corinthians uh, 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin or to become sin so that we could become the righteousness. So this switch, this exchange... Um, you don't have these scripture passages uh, on your page, uh, but, but I want you to think for just a moment um, about a, a two very important concepts. Uh, so when we simply talk about Jesus, the God-man, we must pause and think about the incarnation. What do you mean, the God-man? Okay. How did that occur? And why is the God-man, what we would say truly God and truly man, why is that necessary while we are looking specifically at justification? Okay, we're, go- we're going to come to that aspect in a second. All right, so the humanity side. Why is the humanity side important for our salvation? Yeah, okay. Did you hear that? Matt said, so he can be the second Adam, right? So he can be our representative. You know how the author of Hebrews says, the blood of bulls and goats cannot wash away the sins of man. Why is that? Because it can't be our representative, right? So it must be an equal representation. The only thing that can die for the sins of man is a man, okay, right? And and that is the exact point here in, in Romans chapter five, right? The equality of you were dead in Adam, and now you're alive in the second, second Adam, okay? Um, and to Paul's point a second ago, um, listen to a couple passages from Hebrews. So Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Yet without sin. Let me add one other verse. In chapter 5, verse 9, the author of Hebrews says that, and having been made perfect... That is speaking in regards to Christ, that Christ was made perfect. He became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Now, how is it that the author of Hebrews, one chapter earlier, just said Jesus was without sin, 
And then the very next chapter said that Jesus was made a perfect sacrifice. So my question for you is, what is that second and he became perfect in regards to his sacrifice? What is that talking about? And your clue is it has to do with justification because that's the topic of today. Was the question clear? (laughs) It's a lot of words, so I apologize. The question is, why is it necessary, according to Scripture, that Jesus be made a perfect sacrifice? Be made a perfect sacrifice. In other words, for clarity's sake, Jesus could not supernaturally hover down a 33-year-old man on a cloud and immediately go to the cross and die for our sins. Why? I need more. We're dancing around it. He had to be what? He, he had to be made perfect, though. That's what I'm saying. He had to be made perfect. What does that mean? He had to go through the same trials and tribulations. There it is. Ding, 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 ding. He had to be tempted. He had to not only be tempted, he had to, uh, he had to pass all those tests. That was necessary. Why? Even though our Think about this in terms of justification, right? Again, the equation could not be Everyone look up in the sky. Oh, there's some sort of God man who comes down and dies on a cross. Yay, we're all saved. That could not be the equation. Why? Because he had to live a life and he had to be tempted just like you and I, I are. And he had to be made a perfect sacrifice. That doesn't mean that he was blemished in any way. That means that there had to be a process that led to now it is ready to be filled the perfect sacrifice. That is What's, what's going on there in the author of Hebrews? I don't know anything about that. My, look, I, I, I don't want to get too far off. I, I, I want to say what you, what you must understand in regards to justification is this, right? Jesus was tempted. It was necessary for him to be tempted and for him to pass every test without sin and then to die in our stead. You must be able to see the mathematical equation and equivalence. You have anything to add to that, Matt? You're jumping out of your seat. Yeah. Yeah, outstanding. Thank you. Yeah, amen. Yeah, so if you couldn't hear, uh, very important point. I was digging deep into Jesus and the, the necessity of him being tempted in every way, but there's a second portion of this equation that comes to it. it 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might what? Become the righteousness of Christ in him. That is the imputed righteousness. So this is what's going on in justification. There is the equivalence of him being tempted and yet without sin. And and in addition, the complete fulfillment of all righteousness that gets imputed to us. 
So one way I like to describe this is if you have a book of sins, okay, half of the book is full of sins that you, uh, uh, that you did that you are not supposed to do, okay? But the other half of the book is full of things that you were supposed to do that you didn't do because you were just too lazy to do them, right? Okay, the Lord calls you to love your neighbor as yourself. The Lord calls you to uh, X, Y, and Z, right? The Lord calls you to lots of commands that you just don't fulfill. But the awesome thing with Jesus, Jesus' book has no sins, no, no things that he should not have done. But in addition, his book is full of the righteousness of God because he has completed all that was required of him. And that is what gets gifted to us in justification. Yes. Amen. Say that again. In simple terms, he felt man's need. He felt, he felt man's, man's need. I mean, he, he identified. He identified with us yeah, yeah, in our in our weakness. Yeah. That scripture does say that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Matt. So Matt added a, uh, another great point. When you when you think of the book that Jesus gives you which is his, righteous, his book of, of salvation, it's not just an empty book. If it was an empty book, it would just have nothing in it, right? No sense. It's not just an empty book. It is a full book, a full book of the righteous deeds that he accomplished on our behalf. Does that make sense? So there's the removal of sin, accomplish, uh, there's the no sinning part, but there's also the righteousness that's accomplished on our behalf. This is what we're diving into. This is why, I mean, it gets deep, right? Does anyone, yeah, this is deep stuff. And yet, this is, this is what is behind justification. This is what Christ has done for you. Amen. So this... This plan of God, the scripture tells us it was before the foundation of the world that God purposed to do this. And so this plan of God to justify sinners, right? Scripture talks about Jesus as this representative and as our substitute. And it uses incredible language all through scripture to show us this is the activity of God. And so you've got some scriptures here. I want you to go back and read those um, on your own time, but it all through scripture, it, we see his redemptive work. Every time you see Jesus declared savior in scripture, you're meant to think he, this work of redemption, this work to, to justify us, his work to be our substitute. And so all through here, from his very birth, um, all the way through savior, savior, he is the great God, the great savior. Um, he's our prince and he's our savior. So language all through the New Testament, calling him our savior. But he's also declared to be our Lord. And there's a couple of passages I do want you to see for just a moment. So flip to Philippians chapter two. And just listen to this, follow along as I read it. It's talking about Jesus Christ, and it says, Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, and he took the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That was what we were just talking about how he came and how he identified with us, how he lived that perfect life that we could not live. And look at what it says in verse nine. Therefore, because Jesus did that, because he was obedient to the point of death, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name. So does the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I think it's incredible when we think about Christ becoming obedient, right? The wrath, we talked about this last week, the wrath of God. He poured out his wrath on his son. 
but, yet, but then he exalts the Son who became obedient to the will of the Father. Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. He says, And you who were dead in your trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God has made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. And this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So this work of Christ in justification is this triumphant work, right? He is king, he is Lord, and he has crushed the power of Satan in, in this work. And so I wanted you to see those things as we continue to look at un, this understanding of justification and seeing Jesus in this. So for the sake of time, I want us to move on and understand this next point here that central justification is central to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no gospel without understanding justification. There is no justification without the work of Jesus to be our representative and our substitute. And so there is no gospel without him. And so there's some things I want you to see that we're gonna spend a little bit of time combing through. So you should still be pretty close to Romans chapter five, correct? All right, so go now. You went 12 through 21, verses 12 through 21 of chapter 5. Now, I want you to look at verses 1 through 11, and here's what I want you to do. You can either use the page um, to the left to write it down, or you can highlight or, or circle, underline in your Bible, whatever you want to do. But I want you to read that passage because one of the things we're saying here central to the gospel of Jesus is this idea of justification, and it is an act of God. We've talked about this a little bit before, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to highlight words or phrases that show you that this work of justification is an activity of God. He is the one doing this. And the other thing, while you're at it, I want you to also note where it shows that justification is something that has been done. It's not a future tense thing. It has already taken place in, in Jesus Christ and what he has done. So take just a couple of minutes. It shouldn't take you long to look at verses 1 through 11 and make note of those things. Uh, and then we're going to jump back in, okay? Okay. I think you've had enough time. Everybody ready to keep going? Yes. All right. So did you see that there in those first 11 verses? How do we see that it's God's activity? What stood out to you that just shows you this is God who is doing this work and not man? He's the one dying. He's the one dying? It's good. <laughs> see anything else? By dying, creating access. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, he has poured into our hearts um, through the Holy Spirit who he has given to us. So God is giving us, right? The phrase through him is repeated multiple times in here. So that reminder, this is the activity of God for us. Yeah, the, the idea of reconciliation. He is the one reconciling us to himself. We are not the ones doing that, amen? Amen. That is good. Um, we're saved by his life, right? Not our own. So lots of ways we see that. How about the fact that this has something that has occurred? This isn't a progressive thing that maybe will happen one day, but we are, that idea from last week, right? Luther, Martin Luther saw that we have been declared righteous. This is done. This is a work of God that he has completed, right? How do you see that come to life in these 11 verses? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, has. Yeah, it's past tense. This has been done. We have been justified, right? Christ has already died. We have been justified. We have been saved through his life. So we see that clearly here that this is the act of God 
Anything else you want to add in there? Well, yeah, I was just going to say, going back to think about God's activity, um, right, clearly it's God's activity, but, but one, there's, there's a, a v- very powerful picture in this text um, that actually talks about us that really lets us know that it was God's activity. And what's that picture? Yeah, where, where were we then? Yeah, it said enemies of God. Pause and tell me what an enemy is. Yeah, is an enemy a neutral party? No. All right? So, so often we think about ourselves in terms of, uh, yeah, I was just kind of a neutral, and then uh, someone invited me to church and I came to Christ. Is that what this says? No, it says you are a what? An enemy. What is an enemy doing? Fighting against, okay? That is when Christ died for you. Fighting against. So therefore, it had to be all of God, right? Because what were you doing? Fighting against this. That's when Christ died for you. So it's such a magnificent picture Romans 10, 17. Where it says, this is the ongoing. You come to Christ through saving faith in Jesus Christ. But you're also, it's a, to me, it's a continual process all through your life. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. Amen. So we continually fight against the enemy by building our faith through the word. Amen. Romans 10, 17. Okay, so let's keep going here. Another aspect of this, why this is so central to the gospel, because it is, it is God's graces on display. This is a gracious verdict of God to justify us. I want you to flip to Titus chapter 3. I'm going to pick up in verse 5. It says, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured on us, poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Do you see how beautiful justification is? I mean, think about for those of us who have been justified, things that are true of us. We have had, he has poured out on us this grace, this mercy, so that we could be declared righteous. He has made us heirs in his kingdom because we have been justified. But I want you to see what it's rooted in. So go back up to verse four. I left that off your sheet but I want you to go back and look at this. Look at how Paul frames this when he's writing to Titus. He says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior appeared, then he did these things. He saved us. He justified us. Do you see that? This gracious act of God to justify us is rooted in, he's very specific, God's goodness and God's loving kindness. But this, this should be something that is just so moving. It, it should be so powerful just to meditate on this truth that we're looking at tonight because what it ought to do is just remind you of how good God is so that you can see it in, in, in the everyday of your life because all you have to do is pause and say, you justified me. You declared me righteous through the death of your son through his righteous life that he lived and credited to my account. God, you are good. God, you did that because you are loving and because you are kind. It's a beautiful part of this that I, wanted you, that I want us to see tonight. Another thing here uh, that why it's so central to the gospel is be- we've already looked at this a little bit because through justification, we see that our sins have been remitted and then we have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. We saw this just a little while ago. I want you to, you've got several scriptures there where you can see this listed for you, but 
because we were already here a minute ago, go back to Colossians chapter 2. Write this one down and you can, you've got it as another one as well. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. Yeah, so this, this, is what we were, uh, this is what we were unpacking and, and we referenced this verse. So Colossians 2.14. Uh, I'll start in 13. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So the question I want you to think about for just a moment, this is a deep passage. I want you to think about these terms that are being used. What is this certificate of debt? Okay. So... So Danny said, for every sin, right, God's justice and holiness demands a price be paid. So let's dig even deeper than, than so what is the certificate of debt? All right, it, it is what you deserve, it is, it is your book or your account. You see that? Okay. It, in, in the end of Revelation, in Revelation 20, it says the books will be open. Right? This is your account. And every sin, right? the decrees that are against you, all of it has been recorded. This is your certificate of debt. Right? And what happened to it? Well, that's not what it says. What does it say? Yes, but how was it paid in full? What, is it, what does the text say? It was nailed to the cross. How did that occur? Christ, the perfect sacrifice. But you, you, you need to understand... Listen, listen to me repeat 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin, to become sin. Okay? So what happened to that certificate of debt? It was put on Jesus. That is what we must see. It was put on him. The wrath of the Father was poured out upon the Son for our sin. It was put upon him. The certificate of debt was nailed to the cross. That's what it says. It was hostile to us, but now it has been taken out of the way. Right? And some of you said a really good phrase. It's what you might write at the bottom of a receipt, right? Paid in full. Paid in full. Right? It had to be paid for. It isn't just magically wiped away. It had to be paid for, guys. Oh, the depths of the magnificence of the holiness of God that this had to be paid for. And the love of God that he gave his son to do it. Amen. So, central to the gospel, we've been looking at this, it is, but it needs to be written down here, and I want you to have some other verses to think about here. It's based on the person and the work of Christ, the person of Christ, right? When we read Isaiah, a passage like Isaiah chapter 53, where we see Christ as this righteous sufferer, it says he was the one who was pierced for our transgression and crushed for our iniquities, right? Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. His wounds are the ones that have brought about our healing. He was oppressed and afflicted, right? This is, this is who he is, right? He became sin for us, right? And he suffered for us so that our sin 
could be nailed, nailed to him. But we also see that this work of Christ in doing that, it does some pretty remarkable things that are important for us to understand. His redemption, his redemptive death seals our pardon. Think about that for a minute. It's not in question. It is secure. Anybody ever wrestled with just doubts or assurance? Wondering, right, am I, am I saved? Am I ever, am I going to be able to do something that God changes his mind about declaring me righteous? Right? I mean, this passage. Have I out his yeah, grace? Yeah, have I out it? Right? No, it says, no, you have been sealed because of Christ's work. Right? It was, it was enough. It satisfied the wrath of God. Right? The sin that he bore, not only does it seal us, it brings about our healing, right? The language that is used to talk about us in scripture, we are dead in our sins, right? Like our sin has caused us to be sick, right? We can just look all through scripture from Genesis three on to see the brokenness of sin. Danny Ball, a few minutes ago, talked about, hey, one of the results of the first Adam is broken relationships, right? We see all of this, this sickness that just infects every aspect of God's creation. The work of Christ to justify us is what brings about our healing. It's a, it's a beautiful picture here that we see, right? This other piece that the ungodly have been declared righteous through Christ's obedience, our disobedience is what makes us stand condemned, but Christ's obedience that he credits to us is what saves us so that we can be justified. But I want you to see one other thing here for just a minute, this thread that runs through scripture with this last piece about this person and work of Christ, that Christ's work of redemption clothes us in his righteousness. Just think about that imagery for just a moment, that we have been clothed in the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We begin to just get clues all the way back in Genesis, after the fall. What is it? Look at what it says the Lord God did for Adam and Eve before he drove them out of the garden. It says, he made for them garments of skins and clothed them. Why did he do that? What is it? Okay. What does it say, Adam and Eve, after they ate the fruit? It says they realized what? And they were ashamed, right? So this idea that their sin brought shame. And so God put a covering over that thing that as they recognized it, that it was shameful to them, right? So God covered them. Another thing that we see in here too is that in order to cover them in the skin of an animal, what had to happen? Yeah, there had to be a sacrifice. So sin is already causing death, right? An animal died in order for Adam and Eve to be their shame and their nakedness to be covered. So there's a clothing here. Now look at Isaiah 61. It says, I'll rejo regrace, yeah, rejoice greatly in the Lord. Why? He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He's covered me with the robes of righteousness. Look in Matthew. Jesus telling a parable, talking about this wedding feast. It says, but when the king came in to look at the guest, he saw that there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here? without a wedding garment, without being clothed in the right thing. And so what happened? He was bound and cast out into the darkness. Why? Because he was not clothed in the right thing. Look at what Paul says in Galatians chapter three, verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus, what is baptism a picture of? 
Well, yeah, it's a picture of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. But when we enter those waters of baptism, what is it we are professing? That, yeah, that we've placed our faith in Jesus Christ. Right? We are confessing him as Lord, that we, that we have received this gift of salvation. So it says, for those who have received that gift of salvation by faith have come to Christ and believe that what he did on the cross paid their sin in full. What does it say? They have put on Christ. They are clothed in his righteousness. And then as the New Testament ends in the book of Revelation, it says, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. Every nation, all tribes and people and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Look at that phrase, clothed in white robes. This idea that the righteousness of Christ Jesus We have put that on. We have been clothed in his righteousness. There is a great security and a comfort that we should take when we think about this, about what is ours. Like, what is it that the gospel declares about the work of Jesus Christ and and what we receive as a result of that, right? That we now stand (laughs) clothed, not in our own righteousness, but in his I love that picture, and I love how we can see it running all through, all through God's word. But I want you to see also here that we are justified through faith alone. Right? Our justification doesn't come through works. We've covered that over and over. It comes through faith. We see that Abraham, if we went back to Genesis, it says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Jesus picks up on that idea in John chapter 8 and verse, 40, in verse 56. How are we doing on time? Good. In John 8 verse 56, it says, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Pharisees were like, you heretic, what are you saying? Are you saying Abraham has been gone for many, 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 many years and you're saying Abraham saw you? What is it you're saying here? Right, he's saying Abraham believed. Abraham put his faith in God, in what God said. It says, and because he put his faith in him, God credited it to him as righteousness. Abraham's faith was not in some unknown object. It was in the promise that God said, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Through you, Jesus Christ will come to bring salvation. So through faith alone, right? That's why justification is one of those central things to the gospel is because to be justified, it says we must, scripture says we must come by faith. And then the last thing here that I wanted us to look at, this beautiful truth of the gospel. What what is it that is ours because of justification, God's work of justification? We are united with Christ. We are united with him. Philippians chapter 3. Paul says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. How? Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on on faith. Paul says, the thing I want more than anything is to know Christ. And he says, and hallelujah, (laughs) that has been accomplished through what he did for us. Hmm. Anything you want to add? I'm going to read that passage here in just a second. No, amen. (laughs) 
So here's, here's what I want to leave you with then this evening before we go. I'll ask a question first. As you think through this and you just meditate on everything we've looked at, this is the, an act of God. This is all through the person and work of Jesus Christ. He is our representative and our substitute. All these things that we have seen tonight. Does it leave you with a feeling of unworthiness? Does it make you something, even ask like, God, why? Why would you do that for me? Why would you pour the wrath that I deserve out on your son? Why would he become sin so that I could be clothed in your righteousness? Does it, does it just make you stop and just marvel? Make you even feel unworthy when you just examine your own heart, even even as you walk with Christ and you still see there's still so much in my life that doesn't look like Jesus. How can, how can he declare me righteous? It almost feels too good to be true, doesn't it? I mean, if we're just honest and we think that it just, it causes us just to say, like, I, I don't understand God, how, how, how could you do that? Well, if you think that way, you would not be alone. Uh, in, in that thinking. Um, John Bunyan, uh, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, wrote, um, wrote other books as well. That's the one everybody knows. Um, but John Bunyan wrote other things as well. And in one book that he wrote called Come and Welcome to Jesus, he is looking at a verse in John chapter 6, verse 37, where it talks about Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. I will save to the uttermost, right? And he's just marveling at this. He goes, and, and he writes this beautiful passage here. So when I thought about the fact that we have been declared righteous, not through any righteousness of our own, but clothed in the righteousness of Christ because he became sin for us and our debt was nailed to the cross. There might be moments where we would say what John Bunyan says here, but God, I am a great sinner. But Christ will say, but I will in no wise cast you out. But I am an old sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I'm a hard-hearted sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I'm a backsliding sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I've served Satan all my days, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I have sinned against light, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I have sinned against mercy, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I have no good thing to bring with me, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. This promise of Jesus was provided to answer all objects, objections, and it does. The security that we have in knowing that we're justified, how does that change the way that we would want to live, the way we would want to relate to our Lord? Right? The, 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 the way our relationship with him is characterized. Like, what does that do when you know that it is secure? How does that change our desires? Just think about it. Does it make you want to sin more? No. He is, yeah, to recognize his forgiveness, right? Um, what it took for him to clothe us in his righteousness, right? What it causes us to do is say, God, how, how close to you can I be? How holy can I live? How, how much like Jesus 
you know, can my life demonstrate in my words and my thoughts and my, my attitudes and my actions? Because I want to live like what you have declared me to be, right? That, that is what is, is the heart, I think, when we really understand justification, what it does in the way we live is it makes us strive to live holy lives that, that glorify him. Because what it does is it just gets you to seeing the heart of God, that it was, that he did not do that because there was something that he lacked. He did not justify us because he was missing something. Him declaring us righteous was an act of his goodness and his, his mercy, his kindness. And to know we're recipients of that just ought to bring us to a place of just just falling in love with him more and more every day that we are reminded of this truth that we've looked at over these couple of weeks. You know, I've looked upon the new, in the New Testament as much as the gospel for years and years, but I have never been able to find out the place where the man who was without sin, Jesus, willfully received from his father the sin and the wrath. Uh, I mean, you're talking about on the cross? If you're talking about the Gospels, it would be uh, while he's on the cross and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, so the, the other scriptures are the ones I've, I've quoted to you in terms of like 2 Corinthians 5.21, um, where he became sin. So. All right, so next week, we will pick back up and we are going to spend a couple of weeks understanding the word atonement and what atonement it means uh, and its implications and how it takes us again right to the heart of God uh, in, in what he has done to redeem us and, and draw us to himself. So uh, rich, rich scriptures that we're going to see. So spend this week maybe going back, combing through these scriptures that we've already looked at. Um, and hope you have a wonderful week. God bless you guys.